There are more important questions to be raised than whether private prisons do or do not save tax dollars. Privatization of prisons raises fundamental issues about the role of government in an open and democratic society. Debates about privatization are not simply about the cost and quality of public services. They're also about ideology. The issue is whether society should place market concerns ahead of those of equity and access. In the case of prison privatization, deeply ideological agendas are being played out regarding the future role of government in society. If it were to become universally accepted that a core government function such as imprisonment and the administration of justice can be handed over to the private sector, there few other barriers would exist to dismantling governmental act, uh, action in any sector. The rise of the private prison industry in the US came on the heels of a sharp departure in our penal policies in comparison with the world's other industrialized democracies, such as your own. The astonishing upward shift in our incarceration rate, our famous two million prisoners, um, has swept the country into the uncharted territory of mass incarceration. Mass imprisonment in the US in our time is the creation of social, economic, and political forces driven by dynamics that run to the very roots of our social system and its historical grounding in the slavery of a people dragged from their homeland in chains to our shores. Now, with an incarceration rate somewhat five times less than ours, perhaps you will say, well, but that can't happen here in Canada, not in British Columbia. Um, but, you know, some of us in the states feel that you can trace the relationship between a fast-shrinking social welfare net in the U.S. and our burgeoning system of incarceration, as the social state is deliberately allowed to wither, the police state flourishes. Profits by no means created the machinery of mass incarceration in the United States, no more than defense contractors invented war. But private prison companies are the only sector that were founded for the explicit and paramount purpose of profiting from this phenomenon. And they create a financial momentum that strives to grow its market share, even while a declining crime rate and a slowing economy in our country have combined to level and in some states, states reverse the prison population growth curve. Delegation from the state to private parties of the power necessary to manage prisons and control prisoners can never be completely reconciled with the imperative that above all, the state must strive to guarantee the human rights of all members of society, captive as well as free. Thank you. What I've looked at over the last six years in that first category, this where the private sector actually finances and builds and uh, leases bank assets, I've looked at uh, a youth correctional facility, I've looked at schools, uh, roads, small bridges, PEI Confederation Bridge, big bridge, uh, water treatment plants, recreation centers, frozen food facilities for hospitals, all of these, I've looked at that range. And then the other side, on the other side, of course, some of those also involve uh, the second type of PPP, the operating side as well. On the operating side, I've looked at uh, labs, use of private labs, uh, the handing over of social assistance in Ontario to Anderson, Anderson, Anderson uh, Consulting, and uh, the taking over by private sector of water and waste in places like Hamilton uh, Wentworth. So I've got, I think, a, quite a range of, of case studies. And I'd just like to uh, add to what we've heard so far. I don't think anything I'm saying, I hope I'm not going to contradict anything that's been said, but I think I'm adding to what's been said. If you look at that first group uh, of PPPs, where the private sector is building, financing, leasing back, reducing the debt of governments, increasing capital spending, reducing operating costs, enabling governments to comply with balanced budget legislation. What is the reality? The reality is, as we've heard, that leases are no different from debt commitments. They are future commitments to pay right into the future, 20, 30, we've heard sometimes 100 years, for the use of, of uh, facilities. 
They are a contractual commitment just like debt. We can measure those commitments into the future and we can put a value on them today. When you do that, that's how much you owe. Doesn't matter what the accountants tell you. People who are really in the know, like people who give bond rating agencies to provinces and municipalities, they do that. They do that. You are not saving any debt in any significant sense by doing PPPs in that way. To add insult to injury, you're actually paying more, uniformly, right across the board. These leases have an implied cost of borrowing, which is much higher than anything that governments ordinarily would have to pay. And in every case I've looked at, that is the case. And auditors, we did our studies in some cases before the auditors uh, twigged onto this, but the auditors were very quickly confirmed what we'd found in Nova Scotia, as we've heard, New Brunswick, and Ontario. Let me give you a few examples. Tiny, tiny bridge, Charleswood Bridge in uh, Winnipeg, $11.6 million it cost. By PPPing it that way and leasing it back, you're adding in today's money an extra $1.4 million onto the cost of the bridge. Really big bridge, Confederation Bridge, $45 million extra in today's money. And Evergreen School, New Brunswick, $1 million on $14.7 million. Moncton Water Treatment Plant, $8.5 million on $23 million. These are, these are the best estimates that we've been able to make. The last one is a really cute PPP because this is the one which the Canadian Council on Public-Private Partnerships calls a model both national, and I'm quoting, these are their words, both national and abroad. The Moncton Water Treatment Plant delivers good, clean water, no dispute. People in Moncton uh, believe that uh, there is no debt involved in this because once they paid this $25 million, $23 million to build it, the private partner gave the city of Moncton $23 million up front. There, paid off. As a, as a lease and license payment. Then what happens? Well, what happens after that is that the private partner charges the water fee. And in the water fee, it puts in a capital charge. And when you add up the capital charge, that's where you get the extra $8.5 million. But have you noticed that the very people who tell us that taxes can't be increased, the business community, the consulting community, the finance community, they have no problems with raising user fees. As if somehow it comes out of a different pocket. So yes, the people of Moncton have got a pretty good water plant. But could they have had it more cheaply? Did they need to PPP it? Did they need to give the private partner what appears to be a 25% return on their capital guaranteed for the next 30 years? Did they need to do that? These are questions which I think were never asked. What to do about them? I think the only thing to do about them is to become informed about them, to get as much information as we can, to put politicians and civil servants who are pushing them on the spot, the private sector on the spot, to release these documents, to understand, to have them studied by people who understand the fine points of what's involved in some quite complicated deals, to debate them, and if, as I expect, what we find is more of the same, to resist them across the board. Thank you.